All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Terry Thiel, and we're going to get to hear a little bit about him, his dreams, and his goals, and how we can help. So, Terry, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Thank you for asking. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start sure. with just telling us a little bit about yourself and some of the things that you like to do for fun, that would be great. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a boomer and uh, I'm semi-retired. I've gotten to that point in my life where I, I don't have to um, go into the office anymore. Uh, so I do some teaching, uh, I do some consulting, uh, and I actually wrote a book. Um, and uh, what I do for fun, uh, I, 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 uh, I prefer to work with my hands. I, uh, brain work gets exhausting, and uh, uh, so it's a nice contrast. And uh, for example, I spent most of today building a trebuchet. To I don't even know what that is. It's a basically it's a medieval uh, device uh, that it's a long arm on a stick or on a, on a uh, framework uh, that has a counterweight on it and, and it uh, basically was used to throw boulders at uh, castles. Uh, and I just built one for the grandkids. Uh, we're going to see them this weekend uh, to uh, throw uh, boulders together. Playing pumpkins. <laughs> Oh, gotcha. Awesome. Pumpkin chunking. That is epic. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it keeps me busy. Uh, uh, and, and again, it's a nice contrast to brain work. Brain work can be really exhausting after a while. Yeah. And, uh, just a, a bit of history. Uh, I, I started out working in uh, national security. Uh, so my first job out of school uh, was working in the intelligence community. I worked at Treasury and CIA and DIA and uh, the executive office of the president. And uh, I think what I took away from that uh, in, in terms of learnings uh, is that uh, it's really hard to forecast what's going to happen next uh, because I can think back to 1987 and I was in the National War College. And if I had stood up in class and announced that in two years, the Berlin Wall was gonna fall down and in three years, the Soviet Union would implode, there would have been a lot of you know this and I would have been very politely shocked, you know, get, get them off stage, you know. Uh, and uh, the, the, the big issue uh, is uh, uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. So at the time, I really enjoyed what I was doing. And I figured I've got a career. Uh, I'm going to my, my goal, my, my life's ambition was to work in national security. And uh, we're always going to have a Cold War. So I, you know, I, I was set and then come around 1990 and we won. <laughs> so I have to go on to the next, <laughs> the next objective, the next dream, you know, the next goal. Uh, and I uh, basically spent uh, uh, the next, excuse me, is telling me that we're having a conversation. Um, I spent the next 20 years, 30 years, uh, working in the corporate sector. Uh, so I worked for uh, General Electric and uh, a Swedish conglomerate, AB Electrolux, and spent the last 20 years before I retired with a, uh, a specialty chemical company. And throughout all of that, uh, did strategic planning and uh, or tried to. And uh, I, I guess if you, if, you know, I've got my book in the background there and you can see that screaming lady on the color or on the cover, that is Cassandra. And Cassandra was the priestess of Apollo, the daughter of Priam, who was the king of Troy uh, during, obviously during the Trojan War. And uh, the god Apollo approached Cassandra 
to uh, basically uh, uh, have um, unwanted sex with her. She refused him and he cursed her by giving her the gift of prophecy that no one would believe and that she could not change. And which is why she's screaming. Uh, but Cassandra is the, the patron saint of strategic planners. Uh, you, you spend your life trying to get people to think about the future. Uh, and you can, you can see what's about to happen or you think you see what's about to happen. Um, and nobody wants to listen. <laughs> So my lifelong goal has been trying to get somebody to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. And that led to the book. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. So tell us a little bit more about your motivation in writing the book and just coming on the podcast and all that. Well, uh, the ultimate goal with the book uh, and my motivation is, is based on what I have witnessed over the past 40 years. And I, I gradually developed a couple thoughts. It took a while, but I gradually developed a couple thoughts. And uh, as, as you have, have expressed a, a concern about uh, global poverty, uh, my concern uh, over time was, in addition to that, looking at basically the course, uh, the future of our species. And, and I, I don't mean to sound melodramatic about it, um, but let me give you some context as to why this became sort of my mission. I would argue that our species has lived through three ages. Uh, the first age from about 200,000 years ago when we became anatomically modern, whatever that means, humans, to about 12,000 years ago, that first age we were hunter-gatherers. Second age from about 12,000 years, give or take a thousand, to I'll pick a date, 1785. We were farmer herders. We had settled down. I use 1785 because that's about the time when steam, engine, steam engines became reliable and commercially available. And from 1785 up until, and I'll say 2020 when COVID hit, which makes a nice departure point, we manufactured. It was the Industrial Revolution. We are on the verge, we are on the precipice of what I am calling our fourth age. And what makes this of concern to me, what, what, what I'm witnessing, and, and, and I'm trying to get people to pay attention, we are over those three ages, the rate of change in terms of societal and technological change was relatively slow. It didn't really pick up until the Industrial Revolution. That rate of change is getting faster and faster. And right now it's going like that. And what's driving it are societal disruptions and technological disruptions. And they're all happening at the same time. For example, for the first time ever, first time ever, more people live in cities than in the country. At the present time, half of the world's countries have birth rates that are below repopulating. And in fact, Eastern Europe, Japan, Korea, are forecast to be losing 40% of their populations. They're just not having kids. They're, they're getting smaller and they're getting older. 
And two countries in particular that are having demographic issues are China and India. For different reasons, both of them had a preference for male babies over female babies. China had a one child policy for a long time. <clears throat> for India, it was other cultural reasons, but the net result was China has now past peak population and is beginning to shrink. It's getting older. And there happened to be 20 million, 20, I forget the exact number, tens of millions of Chinese men for which there are no Chinese women. And if you look at India, I think it's closer to 50 million Indian men for which there are no Indian women. Now, if you're looking for political destabilization, that's an awful lot of testosterone, you know, that unrequited uh, male testosterone that's got to work itself out some way or other. So there are a lot of factors impacting destabilization, uh, increasing societal destabilization. When you look at the UN forecast for population growth towards the, through the end of the century, and everybody's always been concerned about we more and more people and more and more people. Well, in point of fact, the UN's data says that after the end of the century, we will peak our population and then start to decline. But there are other demographic experts that say that's gonna happen a lot sooner because when women get to cities and where more people are in cities now, shifting from the country to urban areas. When they get to cities, they have better medical care and more education, and they stop having babies because you don't need them to work the fields anymore. And many demographic experts are indicating that we're never going to get to the UN forecast for population. It's going to peak within the next 20, 30 years, and then populations are going to become to decline. In fact, 95% of the uh, population forecast growth, 95% of it that the UN has forecasted is Africa alone. It's all in Africa. So you've got a whole set of countries that are getting smaller, which is destabilizing. And then you've got African countries that are growing by 500%, which is also destabilizing. So there's a lot of societal things that are happening right now that within your lifetime uh, are going to show dramatic change uh, to the, the makeup of uh, societies. Factor in on top of that what's happening on the technological side. 3D printing, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, cheap, ubiquitous, reliable, off-grid energy, J new materials, uh, just to name a few technological, dramatic technological innovations. And they're all happening at the same time. And so the two things that, that kill me is, is the mindset of, of policymakers, people that go to Davos, okay? Uh, and I'm not picking Republicans or Democrats. It's uh, everybody in, 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 in that group. Their perspectives on what is happening are not taking into account all of these destabilizing factors. So when you, when you take that technological innovation, I would argue that the third ages model of Henry Ford type mass production where you have comparatively few companies making millions of things is going to be obsolesced, is in the process of being obsolesced to a entirely fundamentally different economic model where you've gone from a few making millions to millions making a few the customization of local production 
enabled by technology is going to fundamentally change economics. So, and, and here's, here's my evidence. There's a, there was a gentleman who he passed away a couple of years ago, uh, a Swedish, uh, I think he was a medical doctor, um, Hans Rosling. And Rosling back in 2015 attended Davos and had the thousand uh, attendees do a three question survey. And then a couple of years later, 2017, he went around the world and surveyed 12,000 people the same questions. Actually, it, it turned out to be, a, it was 13 questions, multiple guests on the state of the world, the condition of the world. So for example, one of the questions was over the last 20 years, has extreme poverty increased, stayed the same, or materially improved? The vast majority of people got that wrong. Extreme poverty, poverty over the past 20 years has halved. And when you look at the overall responses to Rosling's questions, the vast majority of the people who should have known the facts, got them wrong. Now, if these are the people that are making policy on, on, for, for all the different governments and what have you, as to how we should deal with our problems, and they're addressing problems that don't exist, but they're missing the problems that do, um, Houston, we have a problem here, okay? Uh, <laughs> And so I'm, I'm sort of rambling here. The, the, the point of the book is to identify these dramatic changes that are coming to make the readers aware of them and to spur an argument. I, I'd love a, you know, a good, get a beer and sit down and argue over what's gonna happen and how to, how to address it. Um, because your future, here's, here's the biggest thing about it. When you think over the entire history of our species up until today, every single generation, 7,000 generations of anatomically modern humans, 7,000, 8,000, I forget the number, a lot of generations, any child could look at their parents and look at their grandparents and say, my, my life, my future is gonna look something like theirs. So how they lived, what they did, what they ate, what they thought is probably gonna look like what I'm gonna do and eat and, and think. For the first time, that doesn't apply going forward. There is absolutely nothing in my experience as a boomer growing up in the 50s and the 60s, and my experience working for major manufacturing companies that did mass production, there isn't anything in my experience that I can talk to my grandchildren that's going to have any value to them confronting the issues of their future world. So Young people today, millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, don't have the sort of guidance that every previous generation had for dealing with the problems of the day, because their problems are going to look, so, your problems are going to look so different than the problems that I encountered growing up. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge. Uh, we're, we're confronting chaos, uh, a chaotic world. If we're at, confronting a chaotic world, what do those kids have left to work with? Well, what they have left are human instincts that we learned 200,000 years ago in an environment that we left a long time ago. And those instincts, I'll, I'll break them down into four. 
The first is, and, and everything is being driven by our biological imperative, which is to pass on our genes. We, everything we do is to do that. Okay, that's what drives us. The first thing is we are scared of everything. We are scared to death of everything. We are fearful creatures. Um, and if we feel threatened, we tend to overreact quickly and violently. We've discovered that living in groups makes it safer. We don't get eaten by the lion if we're in a group. Uh, we have a better chance of finding a mate and passing on our genes. So we're, we're fearful, we live in groups. Within groups, we try to improve our status because the higher up the hierarchy in the group, the better mate we can attract and the better chance of surviving and passing on our genes. And then finally, we're curious. And we're not curious just because it's a wonderful thing to be curious. We're curious about what's over the hill because what's over the hill may eat us and we wanna figure it out before it kills us. That's what drives our curiosity. So when you think about going into the future over the next 20 years, human beings basically have those instincts left because the societal stuff doesn't really work for them. you know. And in a chaotic world where things are destabilized, we tend to become afraid and overreact. And it's one thing to overreact when you've got a spear. It's another thing to overreact when you have an ICBM. Um, the consequences are rather different. Um, and living through the Cold War, I guess why I was really sensitized to, to um, the, the danger uh, that of self-inflicted uh, uh, harm uh, is at any given moment during the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, uh, we, were, we were on the verge of uh, global catastrophe. And, and of course, you weren't raised in that environment, uh, but it, it hung over your head uh, at, you know, in the back here, you know, that, that thought that at any given moment, things could go pear-shaped. And certainly working in national security, that was right front and center. That's what I was seeing every day, uh, which is, I guess, what has propelled me, um, you know, this mission, if you will, of, of trying to put this story together uh, to get people to start paying attention. Um, and here's the hardest part. With the way our brains work, you know, we have this modern rational brain. And then we also have this primitive brain. And, you know, the psychologists tell us that the modern rational brain exists in order to keep that primitive lizard brain in check. You know, we don't want that primitive brain to be doing weird things. So that's our modern brain, you know, is rational and scientific. Well, the current best thinking the current best research suggests that, in fact, the role of the modern brain is not to keep the prim uh, primitive brain in check. The role of the modern brain is to come up with a good story to tell your group as to why you're going to do what your primitive brain tells you it wants to do. Which gets us back to that instinct thing about violently overreacting. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my question to you, Terry, is with the fourth age upon us, what would you suggest people do to adjust for the coming um, speed with how things are going to change? Yeah. And yeah, and the speed is is really the the uh, you you hit it. Uh, that the rate of the rate and degree of change is going up exponentially. Uh, so how do you deal with that? Well, I think the, the most critical factor is getting your facts right. Um, 
decision making theorists use a model it's called the DIKW model data information knowledge wisdom data points if you went back i use intel as an example back when i was in the intel community one of the biggest challenges was getting enough data uh, we didn't have the internet we didn't have google you know and, and how you collected information, you know, the data that you worked off of. Well, today you can Google, so, you know, it's the entire world is at your fingertips. It's a fire hose of data. So the challenge is looking at all of that data and parsing, pulling out of that, the discrete bits information that's material and useful to what you're looking at. So I'm going from a fire hose and I'm trying to get it down to a teacup. And then once I've got that information, then I can find the relationships among the different bits and the causes and effects. And I come up with knowledge, which is usually about how to do something. The difference between knowledge and wisdom is wisdom is, is the awareness that simply because I can do something doesn't mean I should do it. Wisdom is discriminating among different paths of action where my knowledge tells me I can do this or I could do that. If you think, let's say, a military example, um, the enemy's up on the hill, I'm down here with my guys, I can either do a frontal assault, I can do a flank attack, I can retreat. Those are three options. My knowledge base allows me to perform. I can do those things. Wisdom is the question as to which of these should I do and you'll find business is a classic example. There are so many managers. Oh, the time. I mean, there are so many managers who know how to do something and they continue to do it, even though circumstances around them change. I know how to do this. I'm going to keep doing this because I'm good at it. But what they're doing may no longer be the right thing to do. They lack wisdom. And so that whole path, that DIKW path, in order to, under, to get to wisdom, to understand what to do and what not to do, starts with getting data, the right data. And as Rosling pointed out, the information and the knowledge that people at Davos are operating off of, it's, it's the wrong, it's the wrong information. It's, it's bad information, you know? So they're never going to get to wisdom. So to long answer to your question, the, I think the most important thing is pulling together the data, finding the information, you know, and then, and then creating knowledge, but then looking at the different sources of, I do scenario planning, for example, the, the books have scenarios as to what the future might look like. I, you know, who can forecast? with so much uncertainty. But I've come up with a series of different scenarios that suggest it could be this or it could be that. Now, what are the implications of this scenario versus that scenario versus another scenario? And a good example, sustainability, climate change. I think the conversations that are going on this week on climate change, although no one's saying it out loud, are all premised upon an assumption, just an inherent assumption that future economic activity is going to look like past economic activity, only more so. And I don't think that's the case. I think, as I said before, we're going from a few making millions to millions making a few. That is a very different economic footprint. And so whatever they're talking about with climate change isn't taking that into account, nor is it taking into account 
that within our lifetimes, world population likely will top out and then start to decline. Have you heard anyone talking about the implications for policy or society of a declining population where you have fewer children, more elderly people to take care of? Okay. Those economics, those societal demands are a fundamentally different profile than what most people talk about and think about. They've got the data and information wrong. You know, so, so getting people to step back, set aside your conventional wisdom and actually figure out what's, what's the data, uh, that's, that's for me the critical first step. Yeah. yeah. I hope I'm not scaring you to death. <laughs> no, not at all. I love that. That's actually a new thought. I've never had that thought of if our population kind of climaxes and then starts to decline, how that would change. Yeah, I think, I think Eastern European countries are already in declining population. Russia, Japan. If you want to see what a developed world looks like in the, with a declining population, go to Japan. They have numerous villages that are abandoned. Uh, you know, the, the rural populations, uh, they're a 40% population decrease within our lifetime. And the remaining population will be weighted. Their demographic pyramid is gonna be inverted. It's gonna be elderly, not young. So there'll be fewer workers. Uh, and now I'm not saying it's a catastrophic situation, but I'm saying it is a situation that no one in the policy arena, certainly when you look at the media, nobody's saying, hey, you know, in the future, this is, we have to, we got to think about what's the, what's the glide path? What's the trajectory that we have to account for, for when we get to that point? Uh, they're not talking about it. That's the scary thing. So, yeah, that is the book. That's the book. Absolutely. I love that. Well, now we're going to jump into our thriving three. Okay. I'm just going to get to hear a little bit about you. So what is your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. I'd have to say, oh gosh. Uh, I'd have to say that my favorite book has always been um, the uh, Oh, it actually it's a series. It's a, a, a series that was uh, done by um, oh, what's the guy's name? Tolkien. I'm blanking on no, uh, no, it's not Tolkien. Although I do like Tolkien. Uh, this is going to drive me crazy. It's right there. Don't go away. I gotta, I gotta get the guy's name. Uh, uh, all righty. <laughs> all right, Bernard Cornwall. Bernard Cornwall has written a series of books. Uh, and, and by way of background, I studied history undergraduate, uh, so I've always been sort of a closet historian. What Cornwall has done is he has written a whole series of books primarily about English history and their historical fictions. So he has taken the history of a period and then he has populated it with some historical people and some fictional people. And, and written a story about famous events like the Battle of Agincourt or Crecy or the Vikings invading uh, uh, England, okay? And uh, Arthur, you know, uh, King Arthur. And, uh, and he will put a character in and then will tell a story around that historical event. And he has done, and being a historian, I, I've really enjoyed his books because they bring history to life. They populate it with people. And it's, it's so much more believable than just sort of reading dry history. Challenge is making sure that the facts that you populate the fiction with are, are the right facts. So you're not making up history, you know, cause that's, I've read those books and I've set those ones aside, you know. But uh, that's, that's what I enjoy reading most is, is those historical fictions that uh, bring history to life. Love that. What's one way you like to take care of yourself? I'm sorry? 
what is one way you like to take care of yourself? Oh, well, actually, um, I, I, I can't say that I'm a particularly athletic person anymore. Uh, but uh, 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 my wife and I, uh, several years ago, uh, we used to live in uh, uh, Northeast Ohio, Cleveland. And uh, we have subsequently moved down here. We're in North Carolina outside of Wilmington. And uh, it's, it's an entirely different lifestyle and you have to get used to it. And I think the biggest danger for people my age, uh, and as I said, I'm a, I'm a boomer, I'm in my 60s, uh, is you go through that change of life when you've been active and busy and uh, 60 hour work weeks and international business travel and all of that stuff and you, you don't have enough time to uh, sit down and, and, and think a thought. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're, you flick a switch and you're in a different world. And your, your patterns change. And so coming up with patterns that uh, are sustaining, I, I think, is critical. And... It's sad to see the number of people that can't do that. My uncle was in the Coast Guard his entire life before the Second World War on up into the 60s. And he retired chief warrant officer in the early 60s. And um, within two, three years, not even, even that, he basically had nothing to do and he drank himself to death. It, you know, it's very sad. Uh, so to take care of myself, you know, I'm giving you long answers, but that's because I'm a lawyer and I get paid by the word, uh, uh, is, is I, I, I think I live a moderate lifestyle. I don't drink too much beer. I go walking with my wife just about every morning that the weather is clement. Uh, and, um, I go to a lot of good restaurants in the Wilmington area. That's love it. And what's one action step you can take right now to keep getting your book out there and kind of helping people become aware and spark that argument and discussion that you want to spark? Well, that's a, that's a question I'd actually throw back at you because I'm a boomer and I don't, you know, getting back to the whole technological change, okay? I was raised on a black and white TV with three channels and a rotary telephone that had a that had a, a, a party line. And there's a really great YouTube video of two 17 year olds being given a rotary telephone and being given five minutes to figure out how to make a phone call on it. Okay, it's, it's hilarious. My world that I grew up in, my, my familiarity with technology is all after the fact learned. It is not second nature for me at all. So social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, websites, blogs, podcasts, this stuff is all alien territory for me. I'm a stranger in a strange land. Um, and so I don't know quite what the hell to do. <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm trying podcasts i don't know <laughs> i have a website i don't know maybe i should do youtube videos i don't know <laughs> now it's funny what's really funny is my daughter-in-law uh, posted on facebook a, a conversation that she had with her four my my four grandchildren that they have and they, they, a couple months ago, they were watching uh, uh, Christmas movies in the summer. And they were watching Home Alone. And there's a scene where Macaulay Culkin is watching uh, a uh, movie about uh, a gangster movie from the 30s. And he, and he tapes some of the, the sound off of it, so he uses it later. 
but he was using a VHS tape player to show the movie. What's so that? My, I'm I'll sorry. Just play it. I'll just play it. <laughs> So that was that was the kids. They they the, my yeah. grandchildren was going. Well, what what's that machine? And my daughter in law is going. Well, that's a VHS tape player. And they said, well, what's the you know what do you what's that? I said, well, you know, DVDs. And now of course DVD. Who has a DVD? You know, Netflix. <laughs> you know, they got Netflix. You know, you can just dial up whatever you want like that. You know. And she, well, how did this work? She said, well you would go to a store, a rental store, and they'd have all of these bot little uh, cassettes in, in boxes on the shelves. And you could walk through the store, there were thousands of them, and you'd pick out the movie you wanted. And lucky uh, they weren't all gone uh, for if it was a popular movie. And then you rent that, you take it home, and you put it in the machine, you run it. And it we had a separate machine, so you could take it out and rewind it before you took it back. And my one grandson looked at her and goes, how did you live like that? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like well, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm not answering your question because I don't have an answer because I don't know what to do. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, awesome. I think the best way is just, you know, challenge people in conversations that you have with them and make them think about things they wouldn't otherwise think about and get social on social media be outspoken about the things and the problems that you are passionate about. On that note, I think that is a great place to end our show. Terry, thank you so much for coming on. I, I hope I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Terry, thank you guys. If you're listening thank to this you. podcast and you liked what Terry had to say, make sure to reach out to him. How will be in the show notes and buy his book, Our Fourth yeah, Age. That would be nice. And talk to your friends about it and give a copy to your friends. Also, as we always ask, send this episode to somebody you feel like needs to hear the message and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. We're out. <laughs>